Today, we are going to talk about global foundries. But before I do, I want to thank all of you for being here. Thank you for subscribing. It has been six months since we've started this channel. Over 800 subscribers completely blew away our expectations. So we appreciate all of your support. A lot has changed in six months. So we have a special video coming up later this week to kind of review where we've been, where we are now, and where we think the semiconductor industry is headed next. Stay tuned for that. We've also been giving it some thought on how we want to continue to develop this channel and this community that is starting to come together here around Chipstock Investor. I think we should probably start calling it Chipstock Investors, plural. Uh, we know all of you are subscription serviced out. We are subscription serviced out. So we are not going to do that. Uh, but stay tuned for that special video and that special update later this week. Thank you again for being here. Let's get to it. Global Foundries. Before continuing, let me remind you to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if this video is helpful as you do your own investment research and increase your knowledge of business and technology. We really appreciate the support as subscribing to the channel helps us continue putting out content like this. So as you may know, Global Foundries was formerly part of AMD. A little over a decade ago in the aftermath of the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, AMD made a tough decision and decided they were all in on chip design and that they were going to offload their in-house manufacturing. So they spun off the in-house manufacturing as its own separate company, and that is what we now know today as Global Foundries. Global Foundries, we're going to refer here to our handy-dandy semiconductor industry flowchart here. Global Foundries is a foundry. It makes those big silicon wafers that eventually get chopped up into chips, into individual chips and packaged up into some sort of computing or electronics system. So sits at this very critical juncture, roughly at the middle of the flow chart here, chip fabs, global foundries used uh, by all sorts of companies. Um, top, top customers include uh, Qualcomm, MediaTek, uh, NXP Semiconductors, which is itself an integra integrated design manufacturer. Uh, however, uh, a lot of these IDMs, including NXP, um, only have partial in-house manufacturing. And to make up the difference, they often tap a company like Global Foundries for some help. Back in 2018, though, Global Foundries made uh, its own critical decision. It used to compete with companies like Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing at the leading node, leading technology node of chip making, of chip manufacturing. In 2018, they decided they were no longer going to compete on that front and instead make this strategic pivot towards mature node manufacturing. So these are chip technologies that are no longer the most advanced. You can think uh, older but tried and true, tried and tested older chips that get used in mobile devices, uh, industrials like automotive, uh, older chips um, in data centers, communications infrastructure, and the like. So maybe not like the most advanced logic chips out there, uh, but tried and tested. They're affordable, so a lot of customers rely on these. Uh, to manage their own profit margins. And because they're plentiful, they're easy to replace. Uh, that's a very critical feature as well for many of these mature node chips. That in their most recent quarterly filing, uh, sort of an evolution of their end market as well. Back in 2021, just over half of their revenue was smart mobile devices. Uh, that has been reduced in 2022 uh, down to about 46%. Not, not because this market isn't growing, but it's growing at a slower pace than some of these other areas. So data center chips 
uh, were about 18% of revenue last year. Home and industrial, Internet of Things devices also at 18%. Automotive on the rise. And then, uh, like a lot of manufacturing companies, uh, non-wafer revenue. So think engineering services and uh, different design services that they might offer some of their customers also up nicely in the last year as well. Now, these more mature chips have been at the center of the chip shortage the last couple of years. And in many areas, this chip shortage is actually still ongoing, particularly in things like uh, the automotive industry. Uh, many automakers still not getting their hands on quite enough chips that they need. That situation expected to last through 2023. Global Foundries uh, provides a slide here showing what that looks like. You can see that their manufacturing capacity is actually oversubscribed, was oversubscribed in 2022, oversubscribed again in 2023 before starting to loosen up in 2024 and beyond. At least that's their expectation here. Now, that being said, Remember the previous slide I showed you, still almost half of the companies and customers come from mobile devices, mobile device companies. And as you know, the chip shortage has most definitely come to an end on that front. In fact, just the opposite, uh, smartphones and related chips for that market actually in decline at the moment. After two years of heavy spending on electronic devices, consumers taking a big step back on purchases, and there's now actually excess inventory out there of these chips. So Global Foundries still uh, highly susceptible to this market, and we're gonna get into that here in just a moment. I'm gonna show you some of the trending revenue slides here and, and why I'm not buying Global Foundry stock just yet. So let's take a look at that. Here's. Again, another slide provided by Global Foundries in their latest earnings update, fourth quarter 2022. You can see uh, at the top here, their net revenue, nice sequential increase in sales since the first quarter of 2021. Again, remember this company actually had its IPO in 2021. So this is a pretty fresh public stock, but, but they provide this quarterly revenue trend for the last two years, and you can see steady sequential increase every quarter through Q4 2022. So nice double digit increase uh, for the last two years in their sales. And as a result, the company has swung uh, from operating losses to healthy operating profits. So this is a manufacturing business, pretty classic economics 101, the more revenue they're able to take in, the more orders they receive from customers, the higher the utilization rate of their manufacturing process, which means they get more efficient, more profitable. So in the latest quarter, company reported 16% uh, operating income margin. Not the highest out there, especially when you're maybe comparing it to like Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing operating margins of uh, well over 40% over there at TSMC. But a nice goal for Global, global Foundries over the long term uh, as they kind of transition uh, towards this mature node manufacturing uh, business structure and continue to get more efficient over time. But for the time being, not the highest margins. And I think the next two quarters at least are going to get a bit bumpy. So we'll compare that slide I just showed you from the last two years, and now take a look at the expectation for the first quarter of 2023. You can see uh, the company anticipating its first sequential decrease in revenue in over two years. Uh, net revenue expected to be about 1.83 billion at the midpoint. Not only is that a sequential drop-off, but it's actually also about a 5% year-over-year decrease in revenue. Uh, that being said, Global Foundries uh, saw 
this bumpy road coming. Um, they unfortunately laid off employees late in 2022. Uh, they have a cost-cutting plan in place. So the good news, operating margin at the midpoint of guidance expected to be 14%. Again, a sequential drop, but interestingly, actually a year-over-year -year increase in operating profit margin expected in the first quarter of 2023, up from about 11.6% the same period in 2022. So uh, kind of some, some gives and takes here for Global Foundries at the moment. Revenue expected to be in decline for, again, at least I think the next two quarters, but the company much more efficient than it was even just a year ago with those operating margins uh, not only staying positive, but it looks like continuing to rise on a year-over-year -year basis. Now, as for why I'm not a buyer yet, it's pretty simple, actually. So as of this recording, um, March 21st, 2023, Global Foundry stock trades for about 26 times trailing 12-month earnings. I think that is a bit of a steep price for a cyclical manufacturing company. Uh, again, the company sitting at peak revenue, peak profit margin for this cycle that just concluded for the semiconductor industry. We're now going to be in a down cycle for Global Foundries for the next six months or so. So I do think at some point we should see some compression in that valuation on the stock as the market kind of reassesses Global Foundry's expectations for the next few years. This is not going to be a high growth business. By nature, the mature manufacturing node for semiconductors, even when you include some really, really strong growth from the automotive industry, overall, uh, mature chips, not a high growth industry. I think at best, over the next three to five years, Global Foundries will, will average maybe a high single digit or maybe low teens percentage revenue growth rate at best, and maybe get a little bit of margin expansion along the way. Uh, I think that's a best case scenario. So kind of factoring for uh, having a margin of safety, if you buy the stock, uh, I think 26 times trailing 12-month earnings is a bit steep of a price tag. So my fair value estimate, again, uh, just to reiterate here, pulling the trailing 12-month earnings per share from those previous slides that the company provided, $2.62. I'm assuming the company grows those earnings at about an 8% average pace over the next three years, and then earnings level off to 5% growth over the long term after that. Uh, discount rate of 11%. Unfortunately, that puts a fair value on Global Foundries in the low $50 per share range. Currently, uh, as of this recording, the stock trading for $68 per share. So suffice to say, I'm being patient here. Uh, I certainly don't think Global Foundries will fall that far all the way to the low $50 range. But at the very least, I would be more interested in buying the stock presently, given the current outlook, if shares fell under 60 bucks per share. I think that would be much closer to fair value, uh, at least given the current down cycle and the long-term outlook. So uh, that's why I'm not buying at this point. At any rate, I do think Global Foundries is going to be an incredibly important business, uh, not just for the semiconductor industry, but I think, I believe really for the whole global economy, uh, the U.S. CHIPS Act legislation is out trying to get uh, some diversification in the supply chain by getting some manufacturing uh, out of Taiwan and into the U.S. I think Global Foundries and some of its peers like Texas Instruments that focus on mature nodes, mature chip manufacturing nodes, will benefit from this legislation. Uh, similar legislation being worked on over in Europe 
that could also help global foundries. It has one of its manufacturing sites in Germany. So definitely keep this stock on your radar. I think this could be a good one. Long-term revenue growth and margin expansion, uh, those are two important qualities I look for in an investment. And this company could have both of those things going in its favor. I just think it's a bit premature. Or if you're already a Global Foundry shareholder, I hope you've gleaned some insight on the business from this video. Thanks for joining me today. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you don't miss a video. Again, later this week, uh, we have a special one coming up doing a six-month review of the chip stock investors portfolio and where we see things going from here. Thanks again, everyone. See you soon.